So we started from questions. How does this work, by the way? Does this work? That's okay. From questions similar to those asked by Paul Ashton and Paula Hamilton in Australia and Rosenzweig and Thielen in the United States. What are the historical sensibilities, the responses to the past among Canadians? And obviously, some of us were brought in because we are interested in groups of Canadians or areas of Canada. Uh, not public historians, and that's the first thing that I discovered over the course of this project, is that uh, it's an enormous handicap not to have a knowledge of, experience in the field in which we are now working. On the other hand, we bring particular advantages or uh, skills, and uh, what you'll see today is my observations on some of these things. I've got responsibility basically for three and a half chapters of the book, as David did. And so I'm talking basically in ten pages what uh, we wrote in a hundred odd pages. And so, again, like David, I'm just touching on highlights. Uh, first, a note on how autobiographical and family history, which David makes a good deal of in, in his report, uh, folds into group and collective remembering something that Rosenzweig and Thielen in particular had strong views on. Second, the history of public history in Canada, something that, that I hadn't understood at all uh, before I got into this group. And thirdly, historical reasoning. And of all the three, this is the one up from which I am most remote, and uh, which Peter Satius obviously uh, contributed completely uh, to the rest of us. So those are the three things that I'm going to talk about. We understood when we began the project that people would rank the family past as their highest priority. But did this mean that, as self-centered individuals, they had little connection to wider circles? That there was no such thing as society, the famous Baudelaire's Margaret Thatcher quote. Or that people were becoming increasingly distant one from another, the Putnam's bowling alone. Or that people were lacking contact with a longer public past, Eric Hobsbawm's off-cited warning. Our answer is no. We found plenty of evidence of people's interest in autobiographical matters and in their family's past, of course, including mother's recipes and uncle's genealogical research, as the previous study suggested we would. But in the explanations provided by respondents, the trope of selfish individualism, or the charge that citizens lacked an appreciation of the community's past, were not sustained. Rather, people's interest in family history often seemed to be an avenue into the community, a point of entry and a means of access, rather than a mirror or a dead end. Consider these quotations from two Saskatchewan First Nation members. One man said that, quote, his family was tied into the history of Canada, and it's tied into the history of Saskatchewan, and it's tied into the history of Red River. So if I have my family history, I have all that, end of quote. And another Aboriginal person, and this one I've put on a slide, uh, which shows you as well how we created a transcript for the long uh, answers. Obviously people spoke, it was taped, and then transcribed. Jeremy is somewhere in the audience, and uh, Jeremy Weeb actually did this transcription, and so we owe this one to him. But you see a shorthand uh, note on the side here, photos, for example, have you looked at family photos in the last 12 months is actually the full question. And so here's what this Aboriginal man in central Saskatchewan said. Well, I have a collection of photos that I'm just sorting and organizing still in the last week. And the questioner asks, what are they? Are family members from two and three generations back. Interviewer asks again, looking at them by yourself, yes. What are you keeping as an heirloom? I have furniture for my great-great-grandparents, teacups, china, photographs, jewelry. Why are they meaningful? Only to the extent that stories that are shared are told, where they came from, why they helped the people in their lives, and then how they were passed down through generations. Sort of traces of people's moods and ties. Then what traditional cultural activities, later on in the questionnaire, did you participate in? The round dance, the pipe ceremony, the powwow, what book had you read in the last 12 months about the past, a long way gone, the Ishmael Pia child soldier story? What museum had you last attended, the art gallery in Regina? Other activities related to the past do you want to tell us about? Informal discussions with my father. We traveled through the area where his great-grandfather homesteaded. 
showed me landmarks, told me stories of family members, and we visited three graveyards to look at family headstones and take care of the graves. So everything down to here is clearly family, with the exception perhaps of the museum and the book. But it's clearly we've got this man's sense of family and his deep participation in family. Now we flip to a different question entirely. It's a little farther down the questionnaire again. And it's a complicated question that people sorted in two ways, but this man sorted it in the way that I had expected him to. He was asked to talk about a time in the past that was meaningful to him, or a person or an event that was meaningful to him in a really quite profound way that sh shook him in some way. To me, he says, out of the blue, 1885 is very significant because it marks a time in a linear, linear time when the Canadian government ordered troops to attack Aboriginal people. It's not so long ago, you know, for some of us just a few generations. And it was a time when people, culture was changing rapidly, so when people had to adapt to changes. So 1885 is as significant to me as 1867, the Confederation of Canada. And for those of you not from Western Canada, 1885 is a major Aboriginal rebellion and the troops of Canada crushed it. And so we've gone from family to major national event, which he ranks as the biggest event in what he would call the, the ranking of events in his past. And then, when asked to sort out how he would uh, solve an historical problem when, when the, the question, when these resources differed, yet another section of our questionnaire, well, um, I'm thinking of, how do I answer this? You must triangulate the information. Look at it from multiple sources. Questioner, time in your life when you tried? Yes. Questioner, what was it? History books, census records, homestead records, family documents, family members. Now here's, this is historical research. This is an extraordinary step that we've taken from family through nation to historical thought. And so in a way, this man, whom I don't know in any way at all, except through this questionnaire, has sort of serves as a kind of picture of, of what I was looking for in our entire survey. Now, we did not try to quantify the proportion of the respondents who made these larger connections and those who did not. But it would be possible to do so. And that, there's one keen doctoral student in this group. You can have our data and you can do it. And I think it would be a fascinating question to answer. So these are simply the observations of two individuals who saw personal and family connections to larger events and wanted to establish the facts of the history as well as of the personal past, but they were far from alone. We discovered, for example, plenty of support for the claim that the past is a crucial component of minority groups' self-identification. Just as Rosenzweig and Thielen found consciousness of a collective past among African Americans in Oglala, Dakota, just as the Australians found the Aboriginal identifications, so we undertook three special studies. Uh, one of French-speaking Acadians in New Brunswick, one of Aboriginal people in central Saskatchewan, that's those two men I just talked about, and Francophone Québécois, and in another way, a fourth group, new immigrants to Canada. So think about it as three or four. I have, we use both in various ways, but I'll leave it at that. The four groups, we should say. It should be no surprise that individuals in these groups have acquired an awareness of historical tone, if not of specific events, as they've developed their own perspective upon the wider world. This tone helps them to understand what distinguishes an insider from a stranger. Having learned some of the key messages underlying a community of memory, 1885 in the case of that man, they possess not just opinions but convictions about their collectivity's place in the world. Interestingly, the members of each of the three groups where we did special surveys identify a moment of trauma in the past, a drastic, unexpected, uninvited discontinuity. Thus, Aboriginal people's initial contact with Europeans and their encounter with Canada's residential schools, that is, in central Saskatchewan. Uh, Acadians, Grand Dérangement, the 1755, what do we call it, Great Removal, uh, of, of Acadians out of uh, Maritime Canada. Francophone Québécois conquête represent compelling boundary-defining messages to be communicated, reinterpreted, and revivified across the years and generations. 
The past also anchors a popular sense of historical trajectory in each of the three groups. These imagined arcs span an extended period of time and are not identical with those perceived by other Canadians. By building narratives on events and characters in the past, people in each of these communities can make shorthand references to a distinctive moment of origin, a malleable present, and a greater future. These narratives are often the subject of debate. In Saskatchewan, the Aboriginal respondents disagreed emphatically about their own people's trajectory. Some despaired about the present and future, whereas others saw reason for optimism. Among the Acadians, there has probably never been a happier present than at the present. Among Francophone Québécois, there is, I think, an ambivalence that Jocelyn knows much better than I do about where we are now in relation to past and future. Immigrants constitute a really interesting uh, illustration of the survey's successes. They constitute in Canada about one in five people who are not born here but who have moved here. A portion of the population that we wanted to study, therefore, very carefully. Their responses to the survey distinguished themselves from their established Canadian neighbours in several unsurprising ways, including their interest in the past of their homelands and their determination to bequeath national, cultural and faith memories to the next generation. But what's more remarkable is that immigrants' activities in relation to the past were very similar to those of Canadians in general. This included their visits to museums and historic sites, the attention they paid to movies and television shows about the past, and their acknowledgement of the importance of learning more about Canada's past. As the duration of their residence in Canada increased, their interest in Canada's past also increased, and their estimate of the importance of their religion's history and their birth country's history declined. In general, the longer settled immigrants, those who had been in Canada for more than 10 years, were more interested in all types of history than recently arrived immigrants. The survey also suggested the differences between Asian and European origin immigrants were limited and became more muted over time. We found little evidence that immigrants developed a collective memory as immigrants to Canada that was communicated beyond the ethnic community with which they identified. The immigrants' collective remembering existed not as an aspect of a common trans-ethnic past possessed by most new arrivals, renunciation of homelands perhaps, or experiences with Canadian racism, but rather as limited identities of faith and ethnicity that Canada encouraged them to cultivate in the name of multiculturalism. Instead of developing a collective immigrant consciousness in the sense of we the newcomers and they the Canadian born, immigrants reconsidered their family, ethnic and nation state history during their first decade in Canada. In other words, national or cultural heritage at the beginning trumped immigration itself as a marker of identity. And although immigrants did not typically renounce their birth country, their affection for and loyalty to these memories diminished over time as they accepted an obligation to learn about Canada's history. The pattern of their museum and historic site visits and their comments about the tension between their two pasts, and of course it was often cases is more than two, but just for simplicity's sake, their comments about the tension between the, their two pasts illustrated their awareness of this expectation that they learn about Canada. So that's chunk one. How am I doing on time? Okay, chunk two is about public history. Now this is the one where I said I had the troubles and I thank goodness that we had a session last night to, to help me understand what it was that we've been struggling with. This is the chapter on public history. One might argue that of the many themes in the story of public history in Canada, three had particular resonance in our survey. First, the history of the state in Canada. Second, the history of public communications in Canada. And third, the impact of the internet and the web. 
Now, I'm going to explain a little bit first what I mean by these three, and then I'll go into the survey. So first, the state. Government intervention, as Dalton said in his introduction, is enormous in the post-Second World War decades. Museums, historic sites, libraries, archives, arts funding councils, it is absolutely astonishing to see the expenditure by the Canadian state, not just in its national form, but in its provincial forms and municipal forms, by the state, by the collection of our taxpayers' dollars, and then its pouring out of these taxpayers' dollars, into awareness of the past. So that's step one. Step two is the emergence of another sector of public history activity. <coughs> partly, <coughs> partly, quasi-state you could say, partly voluntary, sometimes with political messages, <coughs> sometimes with other kinds of historical messages, uh, but always, I think, the key factor that I want to center on is television. And I'll explain why in a minute. <clears throat> but what are the other kinds of illustrations of quasi-state and non-state actors pushing public history in this generation? Well, you don't have to go very far to remember these. Red Wilson's pro-business vision for Historica. The Dominion Institute's desire to see a political history and political facts embedded in people's minds. Uh, Mark Starovich's nationalist Canadian history on CBC and so on. I think that television is key in this story, and let me explain why, by going to the survey's results. And again, I thank Jeremy Wee because this is one of the special little studies that he did, so Jeremy, thank you. Consider the delicate matter of Canada as nation state, standing in Quebec City it's always a delicate matter to be talking about Canada as nation state. It, talking about it in English in Quebec City is a delicate matter. And I want to go into that. The last substantive question in our interview, which probably seemed to respondents like a moment of relaxation at the end of a quite intensive conversation, a conversation that involved 70 to 75 questions, <laughs> that averaged 22 minutes, but for some people went on as long as 40 and 50 and 60 minutes of conversation, ends with this. Some people think it's important for the next generation to know about history in the past. What is it about history that you think should be handed down to the next generation? To get a handle on the responses, we picked a random sample of 10% of the interviews to probe more deeply. Nearly half the respondents offered platitudes, and I won't tell you the platitudes you can imagine. What do you want to hand down? Uh, peace and truth and love and so on. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to dismiss love. Uh, the other half was split three ways, making family or autobiographical references, global references, and national observations. These national references constituted one-sixth of the total. Now remember, you can do anything. You can talk about anything in this last question. And one-sixth of the people talked about the, the nation in some way. Some spoke about sacrifices made by individuals and families in wartime, and the opportunities for today's children that have been made possible by previous generations. Assuming that the question about what should be handed down contained a national implication, one Ontario woman's reply was typical of the roughly one in six who spoke of the national context. What should be handed down? All the facts, I guess. What creates the country? What makes the things happen? Or what creates change? And it's good to know, you know, why the country is the way it is. Almost certainly, the post-1945 attention to Canadian history in schools and other public institutions the effective use of those both kinds of those uh, public historians of such communications media as museums and television and historic sites contributed to the national focus of so many of these responses. Now, I think one sixth is a lot, but those are the sorts of things that will have to people will have to pursue over the course of subsequent studies. Now, what about public history in the second category, relating to the other kinds of identities? and my interest in television. Consider the three groups that, that we studied uh, carefully. Aboriginal people in Saskatchewan, Acadians in New Brunswick, Francophones in Quebec. Uh, 
The story of each group's history has been propagated differently in the last 60 or 70 years. That should be no surprise. And the media establish a kind of line in the country called French and English that is far more important in the radio and television age than it ever was before. The fact of the language of communication matters a great deal. And of course, the fact that there are five, six, seven, depending on the decade, million people in Quebec makes an enormous difference distinguishing the people of Quebec from the Acadians of New Brunswick when we have that line, even though they're both within a bilingual Canada. The people of Quebec have state aid in the creation of a television universe that is all-encompassing when television becomes the all-encompassing communication medium of the 1950s through the 1990s. In Saskatchewan, by comparison, the First Nation people relied on family memories only, and then a community-led revival of, quote, traditional teachings in little local events like powwows. And only recently, in the last decade, upon colleges and museums to present an aboriginal historical perspective so that communications technology, the state, and language make a difference between what is happening in Quebec and what is happening in New Brunswick. And both, the state in each case, differ from the Aboriginal people in Saskatchewan who have neither upon which to rely. So, I make a, a generalization here at the end of this that you're going to find a little hard to swallow, but uh, the cultural output did not result in distinctions in the strength of these three groups' identity. The strength of their identity was comparable. Rather, it affected the form of its expression and the group's capacity to win the attention of outsiders. The third phase of public history is the internet. And David has already alluded to how am I doing on time. Uh, fully 40% of our respondents, as David said, used the internet in the preceding 12 months, and this was in 2006-07. I'm sure it's doubled in the period since. It's an amazing number when we consider the internet is so recent. Recent immigrants were more likely to employ the internet to explore the past, 57%, than were their Canadian-born counterparts, 35%. While resort to the internet has some association with age, the younger age profile of recent immigrants does not explain away this difference. Like the younger respondents in the Aboriginal sample, recent immigrants seem to be relying on the web as a way of exploring the past in numbers not matched by other Canadians. And so our chapter on public history concludes, whether established institutions tasked with conveying the past in public can withstand the extraordinary impact of the internet which has altered so much so quickly and with so little concern for time-honored traditions, remains a central question for anyone concerned about the presence of the past. Part three of this is about historical thinking and the trustworthiness of information vehicles, which is Peter's section of, of the book. And have I got five minutes? So we ask, are there certain sources of information about the past that people are more likely to trust? We can say very clearly that there are. More than 60% of respondents found museums very trustworthy, as David noted. Historical sites were a close second, with more than half respondents considering them very trustworthy. Followed in order by nonfiction books, family stories, teachers, and websites. In that order. A number of respondents considered the sources we inquired about as somewhat trustworthy. So now ask about the somewhat trustworthy. Teachers, family stories, websites, and nonfiction books hover at about 50% of the sample expressing qualified trust. Internet websites were, by a large margin, margin, less frequently considered very trustworthy and most frequently considered not very trustworthy. Summarizing the comparison, Two sources, museums and websites, stand at opposite ends of a trustworthiness spectrum in the eyes of Canadians. Canadians who consider family stories most trustworthy are demographically different from those who consider other sources, and particularly museums, to be so. 
About twice as many respondents, age 75 and older, compared to every other age group, identified family stories as most trustworthy. And these older respondents were about half as likely to identify museums as most trustworthy. Aboriginal people, respondents with less than high school education, those with lower incomes, and those who expressed no interest in the past, were also more likely to identify family stories as most trustworthy and less likely to identify museums as most trustworthy. So that's one bit of quantitative stuff. People explain their granting of trust in three ways. First, in placing their faith in the word of institutions, they recognize the training and expertise of personnel, the time and resources allocated to research, and the systemic checks against error. This type of trust was expressed in relation to teachers, museums, historic sites, and books. Second, in placing their trust in artifacts, expressed mainly in relation to museums, archives, and sites, they were emphasizing the importance of authentic traces of the past that conferred authority back to the authenticity story. The third type, personal trust, was based on face-to-face -face relationships between the person giving and the person receiving the historical information often, but not always, a family member. And so what Peter did in this section was actually establish the nature of the explanations of people's uh, willingness to allocate trust. Another way to think about trustworthiness is to ask how active or passive people are in confronting historical information. Do they see the questioning of sources as the way to use them for establishing what happened, or did they rather express complete faith in their sources. While trust in family stories is more likely to be based on faith, and the artifact-rich museum exhibits were more likely to involve interrogation of sources, there's no simple correspondence. Those who attended educational student institutions above high school had a more active, questioning attitude towards historical sources. And those in the oldest group, 75 and older, were much less likely than younger people to be active investigators. One explanation for this pattern is a generalized cultural shift over the past generation that has seen the decline of the authority of experts, as Thomas Haskell framed it. Another is that what students did in schools shifted in some fundamental way in the decade of the 1960s, and that the generations following had a different approach to knowledge, including historical knowledge. So the questions about trustworthiness of sources offer several lessons. Schools, museums, and historic sites could work more coherently to further active investigation and to foster a critical approach to it. History teachers, by incorporating in their lessons more of the real stuff, primary source documents, first-hand testimony and artifacts, and place. Museums and historic sites, where the real stuff is already on display, by further developing among their visitors the critical thinking that leads to insightful history. People exposed to these practices are more likely to understand the necessity of consulting multiple sources, the value of interrogating the traces of the past, and what to do when confronted with conflicting accounts. They're thus better equipped to assess truth claims, whether about the past or the present. And so that's the end of the, of the section that Peter is uh, almost exclusively responsible for. I skimmed over three subjects in this paper, all based on responses to our surveys, to make several points. First, that autobiographical and family history does fold into group or collective remembering. Second, that there can be a history of public history that it is essential if we're to understand the state of public history today, and that, of course, the internet is upsetting everything. And third, the historical reasoning how people assess the trustworthiness of sources of historical information matters a great deal and that we have a great deal to do in furthering it. Thank you.